Uh, welcome, I'm Doug Lontine. Uh, I'm the Dean of UVM Extension and the Director of the Food Systems Initiative here at the University of Vermont. And uh, I want to thank you for coming and welcome you on behalf of our President and our Provost and our faculty and, and all those here that work on food systems at the University of Vermont. And also uh, our collaborators across the state and that's uh, in other institutions of higher education as well as collaborators of all types. Um, we're glad to host this fourth annual Food Systems Summit, and, uh, and I'll be introducing Lori Restino in a few minutes, um, and she is from the Vermont Law School, who were uh, in collaboration with to put on the Food Systems Summit this year, and it's been a great year and a great collaboration with the Vermont Law School. And in fact, they came to us last year and said, would we collaborate, and we said yes, and they said, we have a pretty good idea, we think, it's called the right to food, and we said absolutely, and so here we are a year later, and thank you, Lori, and the Vermont Law School. We have a broad range of participants at this year's summit as well. Um, or around 300 are here, for everywhere from the faculty and the nonprofits and the business and the government uh, representatives. So again, welcome all. Um, we do this, we have three keynote speakers, and we do this because we want to have you folks talking to each other. Uh, you'll see you're at round tables, um, and those round tables are to facilitate conversation at the breaks uh, or um, uh, between speakers or for question and answers. So, um, and those that are here from Vermont, um, remember to introduce yourselves. You're the hosts. All of us from Vermont are the hosts. So remember to not just talk to your colleagues, but to reach across the table and, and meet some new folks as well. So I really much appreciate that. Um, another time to get to know each other will be at dinner. We do not have and do not host a conference dinner. Uh, we invite you to look at the list of uh, restaurants that serve a lot of local food and the restaurants here in the Burlington area and downtown Burlington. And we encourage you to meet some new friends and, uh, and make a reservation and go out to dinner and, and try our, our local fare. Uh, lots of great chefs and lots of great restaurants to try in the Burlington area. So with that, I've got three or four slides. Um, talk a little bit about the Food Systems Summit uh, here at UVM. Um, we have a commitment uh, to studying the food systems. Uh, we recognize the opportunity for cutting edge, transdisciplinary, solutions oriented food systems research at UVM to address food systems issues. Therefore, we try to support our faculty, our students, the research, and the academic programs related to food systems anywhere they occur across campus. From philosophy, to anthropology, to geography, to the arts, all in the College of Arts and Sciences, to the efforts in health and nutrition, in our uh, medical center and our uh, nursing uh, school, our nursing college, as well as through grant writing support, seminars, social gatherings, and communication about the UVM Food Systems Initiative with email lists, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, not to mention our website, which I would invite you all to visit. Many of our faculty and students integrate coursework and research and service learning with Vermont farms and farmers and nonprofits and government agencies. We have service learning courses focusing on food systems and we encourage the interest of students for internships and experiences focusing on food systems. The Food Systems Internship Program just finishing its second year. I saw Matt Meyer sitting around here at some point. There he is. Uh, he's helped uh, create 130 placements in the last two years. And this is, folks, uh, our internship runs. I don't know if you've put anybody in a boardroom, but uh, if someone has an interest in uh, going to, uh, to a large corporation that's food-related or they want to learn how a farmer weeds the fields, we'll help put them in internships that meet their needs here and their interests here because we're interested at community-focused food systems. It's not about creating it all in a community, but we want it to be focused on the community. We have a food systems graduate program. Our second cohort of master's students graduated this past May, and uh, we just had a PhD program in food systems approved this spring by the Board of Trustees. We have a farmer training program, literally folks that want to come and learn how to farm, 
the noisy ones over there in the left corner. Uh, they come in the spring and they leave in the fall. They come before planting and they leave after harvest and they learn about uh, being a farmer. And this is its third year. We have a Breakthrough Leaders in Sustainable Food Systems Leadership Program with another 25 participants that are on campus this week. They're in the other corner over there. Um, and they have done some online work and then come together this week uh, to interact again around what they can do uh, in their realm of food systems, all supported by our continuing um, and uh, distance education uh, unit that Cynthia heads up. We see our campus and all the units on campus and our collaborators across the state as a way of making our state food system a laboratory for innovation. And that includes our, our partnership with Sodexo and other food um, to institution folks across the state. We at UVM signed the Food Challenge uh, Campus Commitment in 2012, and we're about 15% real food now, and we're going to continue to work uh, toward the goal of 20 by 20, and actually Sodexo and UVM have agreed to continue to move beyond that. So we have that new dining services contract with Sodexo, and we're really looking forward in that partnership going forward. Um, the summit itself um, is an annual time to come together uh, to highlight and learn about new ideas from our speakers, from you, to generate new knowledge and discussion, again, among us all, to network among ourselves, and to further our awareness and importance are important around poop, awareness of important food systems issues. We wish to continue thinking with others on the complexity of the food system, but also consider key elements of policy, behavior, and production in our learning and our understanding of the food system. It is one of the benefits of inviting three great keynote speakers and panels that give us some insight across all three of those areas. Biophysical constraints. We like to look at all three. So this is the theme about land use and environmental considerations on agricultural production. Can we be ecologically, economically, hydrologically, energetically sound and intensive? Geopolitical context. This theme is about power in the food system and food sovereignty from a local and global perspective and behavioral and cultural considerations. This theme is about how social factors affect what and how we eat. How do cultural values influence food and practice? Or food practice, I'm sorry. We've asked each of our keynote speakers to speak to one of these themes, and we have a panel that will also follow up with their specific research in these themes. We have many people to thank some keynote spe uh, sponsors that I've already mentioned are the Vermont Law School, the City Market, Lambert and Coffin, Attorneys at Law, American Flatbread, and Sodexo uh, are all keynote speakers. And again, especially uh, Lori will be up in a few minutes. Uh, a great many thanks to the Vermont Law School and their folks. We also have many other supporters, uh, including the Macmillan uh, Endowment that provides a nice sum of money each year to help us uh, put on this conference, as well as the Aiken Lecture Series, which is an endowment as well that they support uh, this conference, as well as the Vermont Higher Education Food Systems Consortium, which is made up of a multitude of schools here in the state, all working on making Vermont a food systems education destination. And we really appreciate all of the collaboration we have here in this state. So with that, uh, I've got a couple requests. One, if you use Twitter, please use the hashtag UVM Food Summit. And as a little incentive uh, to engage with us on social media, uh, we will um, have three drawings for the top tweet and um, so we, um, uh, I won't give away what the prizes are, but I'm sure it's well worth it. Uh, Alice, Allison has the secrets uh, uh, put away. But for the top tweet, UVM Food Summit. Um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Lori Restino. Oh, I forgot one other thing. There's a farmer's market. This was an addition to my minutes. There's a farmer's market downstairs, and I passed right over it in my notes. 
that if people are willing or are able or interested in, uh, oh, it's from one to five today outside the Davis Center. So if you're interested in going home with some fresh fruits and vegetables um, from our farmer practitioners, um, one to five today outside of Davis. So with that, Lori, why don't you come up? She's, Lori is the director of the Center for Ag and Food Systems at the Vermont Law School. She's an associate professor of law and the faculty advisor to the Vermont Law School's Food and Ag Law Society. I'm not going to read this whole thing uh, since you have many accomplishments, but I will say uh, she has previously taught at the environmental ag, uh, environmental ag course at George Washington University Law School. She's an associate member of the Environmental Law Institute, a member of the American Bar Association, Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources, and a member of the American Ag Law Association, and one great partner. So thank you, Laurie, and it's all yours. I'm a little bit shorter than Doug. Um, it's a pleasure to be back again this year, but even more importantly, uh, a partner of UVM. So I direct the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at the Vermont Law School. Uh, we are not even three years old, but we are already the most comprehensive law program in sustainable food, agriculture, and the environment in the nation here in the wonderful state of Vermont. Uh, and I have a wonderful staff, a lot of which are here today. Our team is here and was really kind of uh, very instrumental in helping UVM put this on. So we're very grateful to be here with you all today. Um, and I, I want to more formally express my appreciation to UVM, which not only welcomed Vermont Law School as its collaborator for this summit, but has been a gracious partner since VLS started the center less than three years ago. People often mistakenly think that Vermont Law School is part of UVM. In fact, we're not. We do have Vermont in the name, but we're not. Vermont Law School is a small, independent law school in the heart of Vermont, and we are known for the depth of our environmental program. And that's part of the benefit of what we bring to the study of ag and food, which is so closely tied to environment and so dependent upon it. So our partnership with UVM is not born out of an institutional mandate, but I believe our mutual desire to combine our intellectual strengths in ways that benefit our students and society. And that is at its heart what this summit is about, feeding a growing global population, not over nine billion by 2050, without destroying our planet is one of the critical challenges of our time. This is not a challenge that can be addressed by linear thinking. Food security is a systems-based operational concept. To achieve food security, we must grapple with the web of issues encompassing environmental, social justice, development, trade, to name a few. That is not to say that we should be paralyzed by the sheer complexity of the task, but rather we must, re we must leverage our intellectual and experiential cap capital more effectively. What do I mean by this? In a world generating gobs of informational white noise, we need to engage in problem-solving design which helps guide knowledge synthesis and informs how we communicate its results in ways that society can actually access and use. And we need to ensure that knowledge born of metadata does not leave en masse the public domain. This requires public investment as well as a higher order of collaboration, which inherently means it must, it must also be transdisciplinary. This summit intentionally adds the law and lawyer advocates to the mix of scientists, social scientists, and practitioners. Systems-based challenges require us to invite the knowledge of others. Sometimes the most fundamental barrier to collaboration is not recognizing the limits of our own knowledge. The second critical step is how or who may fill knowledge gaps. Overcoming these barriers requires a more dynamic and rigorous transdisciplinary practice and exchange than we currently have on a regular basis. These interactions, I think, really need to become more reflexive. I think of this summit not as a one-way street of academic reporting, but a space to exchange and link ideas. I challenge you to think about your own role in this exchange and maximize your time here. Reach out to your table mates, introduce yourself to a panelist from a different discipline, stay in touch with the people that you meet today. 
We hope that over the next two days, new collaborations will be born, new connections will be made between people, academic disciplines, and practitioners, as well as within our own thinking. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Professor Jamie Renner, who leads our Food and Agriculture Law Clinic. It's one of the few in the nation. Prior to joining us, Jamie was an AmeriCorps volunteer working with elderly Vermonters in farming communities. Prior to that, Jamie had been working as an associate at a high-powered Manhattan law firm and left for Vermont to do work that fed his soul, and I do mean that. At the clinic, Jamie trained students to be sustainable food and agriculture advocates by creating legal tools to support sustainable food systems. The clinic embraces the very qualities that fuel the food movement, such as social entrepreneurism and the innovative use of media in thinking about how we can design legal and policy solutions. Please welcome Professor Jamie Renner. Um, thank you, Lori, and thank you very much to Vermont Law School for hosting this conference and for inviting us in Vermont Law School to help shape and participate in this crucial discussion. Um, I want to thank, in particular, Allison Nyhart at UVM and Rebecca Valentine at Vermont Law School. <laughs> Allison and Rebecca uh, coordinated this event from soup to nuts. Um, as Lori mentioned, I'm a lawyer and a professor at Vermont Law School Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, and I'm here to introduce our conference theme, The Right to Food. On a personal level, I'm here as a result of an interaction I had with two police officers in Abuja, Nigeria in August of 2005. My subsequent work as an international law firm in New York City, my experience as an AmeriCorps volunteer in Vermont, and my current work supervising the Food and Agriculture Law Clinic at Vermont Law School and teaching global food security. To explain, in 2005, I traveled to Nigeria to work for a Nigerian human rights attorney, Hawa Ibrahim, who was then representing women and children in criminal proceedings in rural Islamic courts. A week after I arrived, Nigeria police force officers opened machine gun fire on a car full of 620-somethings at a police checkpoint about a mile from Hawa's home where I was living. The gunfire killed five, a police officer strangled the remaining victim, then several officers worked to bury the dead in shallow graves and frame them as armed robbers by slinging guns, knives, and machetes into their bullet-riddled, blood-covered car. Within hours, the victim's home village erupted into riots, believing the killings were ethnically motivated. The police officers had been Hausa, the victims were Igbo. As one day of riots expanded and intensified into two, and as the rioters burned down the federal police outpost in their village, the president of Nigeria appointed Hawa, my supervisor and friend, to a federal presidential tribunal inquiry to investigate these killings, as well as the broader phenomenon of extrajudicial killings by the Nigerian police force. These killings had become almost commonplace. During the prior year, 2004, the Nigerian police had unlawfully killed a recorded 2,987 people. That's eight per day, one every three hours. The question for the tribunal was, why were these killings occurring? Hawa and the tribunal of four others investigated, digging at root causes of police violence through eight weeks of closely watched, nationally televised public hearings. Working for Hawa, I serendipitously now worked for the presidential tribunal, attending public hearings and interviewing police officers, citizens, and NGOs focused on the rule of law and police violence. Ultimately, we observed that poverty was a primary contributing cause of this violence, in combination, of course, with Nigeria's unique history of colonial rule and successive military dictatorships, all of which had used the police to enforce their authoritarian power. Poverty undergirded a continuing national epidemic of armed robberies that inspired fear and aggressive police response. And the police were poor too. They earned on average $60 a month, $2 a day. Many of the officers were homeless and slept on the floors of, the, of their stations. To some extent, we saw, it was out of their own desperation that they used their power and weapons to violently extort money from civilians. 
One police officer said to the press, only through black magic could anybody feed his wife and four children for 30 days with the kind of salary the Nigeria police force pays me. The fact that all police officers needed more than they earned facilitated a culture where officers turned blind eyes to each other's extortion and corruption and even created systems for sharing extortion returns up the chain of command. A week before Hawa and I nationally published the results of our investigation, I found myself at the center of the phenomenon we'd been studying. One hot August summer day, as I and another lawyer from Hawa's law firm named Bello drove through downtown Abuja, two police officers stepped off the curb into the dusty intersection in front of our car and waved us to a stop. They approached our vehicle, opened our back doors, entered our back seats, and began yelling at Bello to drive, vigorously pointing forward. Bello pushed on the gas, and I asked where we were going. One of the officers said, Garki, the name of the station that housed the officers who'd shot and strangled and framed the kids, the station we were investigating. Also disconcerting, I recalled that the station was in a different direction than where we were driving. They were lying. Why? My head began to spin. Did they know who I was? Was this retribution? Was this coincidence? As we proceeded onto a smaller, dusty road heading toward the outskirts of the city, I lost control of having no control and told Bello, pull over. Desperate and confused, he did. I turned in my seat toward the officers behind me and started talking. After several intense minutes of begging for kindness and arguing for a negotiated solution to the completely ambiguous but terrifying direction of the circumstances, the officers finally accepted all of our cash on hand, presumably their goal from the beginning, and directed Bello to drive them back to the city center. We drove in silence. Again, they pointed where to turn, a left, a right, and then they ordered us to stop. We were parked at the entrance to a massive open-air food market. They exited our car, slammed their doors behind them, and walked into the market, our cash in their hands, exploring each wooden table they passed, yams, mangoes, bananas, goat meat, fish. Food security, I observed, was national security. This was rule of law, extortion, corruption, poverty, ethnic tension, violent crime, political history, life and death. Back in the United States, I worked at an international law firm stacked on two floors of a skyscraper between Times Square and Rockefeller Center. At the time, I felt very far from the land of food justice issues. The firm's clients were primarily major energy corporations. For example, we represented massive, public, hydraulic fracturing companies under government investigation for whether they properly disclosed the environmental risks of fracking. The company's board had hired us to conduct internal investigations of the companies targeted at answering three primary questions. How, at each level of operations and management, did the companies evaluate and manage the environmental risks of fracking? What internally were they concluding about these risks? And based on these conclusions, what were they disclosing to the public? My job was a fascinating front row seat that left me up at night wondering not just about the environmental risks of energy production and the responsibility of energy companies to consumers, investors, and the environment alike, but about the underlying demand for energy. Who demanded the energy that drove the consumption of natural resources and the related environmental risks of concern? There again, I stumbled back into the food system. From farm to plate, the global industrial food and agriculture system eats fossil fuels. Energy, of course, is used to generate agricultural inputs, mechanization, fertilizer, pesticides, and irrigation. It's used to transport inputs like synthetic fertilizer from factory to farm. Beyond just oil and gas, it's used in harvesting, processing, distribution, storage, and preparation. In fact, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that the food sector accounts for 30% of the world's total energy consumption. I also saw that a certain form of agriculture, industrial agriculture, was accounting for the majority of agricultural energy consumption, and that it was this form of agriculture that United States agribusiness was marketing and exporting to the world, leveraging narratives and data of food security, population growth, and climate change for sales. 
What, I wondered, were the environmental impacts of this form of agriculture? As a package of inputs and method of practice, it appeared to, be, it appeared to potentially threaten biodiversity and the quality of topsoil, thereby threatening short and long-term food security as well, and generating immense amounts of greenhouse gases in the process, only compounding this food security challenge. And what were the economic and social impacts of global agribusiness and industrial agriculture? What did increasing corporate governance of the food system mean for the poorest in the world, half of whom are small-scale farmers? What system was I helping to power? After four years in New York, I resigned and joined AmeriCorps, as Lori mentioned. My goal was to move to Vermont, a landscape I've long loved, and attempt to reconnect my career with a social mission. I performed my year of AmeriCorps service at the Central Vermont Council of Aging in Barrie. I joined this particular organization because I've always been interested in mortality and how our culture responds to it, and I carry a related frustration at how we generally marginalize our elderly population. As an AmeriCorps volunteer, my job each day was to make home visits to low-income elderly folks across central Vermont to help them with essential day-to-day -day needs. I stacked wood, shoveled snow, cleaned bathrooms and kitchens, and made friendly visits to people who were just lonely. I also spent much of my time transporting people to food shelves, to senior meal sites, and to grocery stores. I held frail arms going down long fluorescent lit grocery aisles, reached for essential items off high shelves, pushed loaded carts and carried bulky grocery bags, escorted people back to dilapidated houses and dim apartments, and often helped open a can, package, or bottle before I left. On occasion, I made emergency food runs. Someone had clear run out, but was too proud to ask for help. A family member, neighbor, or social worker had noticed empty shelves and called us. Throughout the year, I noticed a trend. Often, I was visiting former farmers, people who had once made a living from the land, but whose businesses declined as Vermont's agricultural economy shifted, people whose spouses had passed away and whose children had left the farm and left the town and state for economic opportunity. Now, despite their lives as strong, independent farmers, obvious by their large, knobby hands, old family photos, rotting barns, and lingering tools, they were alone and food insecure. Since living here, I've learned that 83,000 Vermonters are food insecure. That's 13% of all Vermont households. Practically speaking, this means that 83,000 Vermonters live in households that, due to financial constraints, are running out of food, reducing the quality of food that they purchase, or feeding their children on balanced diets. These are households where parents are skipping meals so their children can eat. Today, almost 20% of Vermont children and 8% of Vermont seniors live in food insecure homes. 30,000 Vermonters, and that's 5% of them, report that as a result of their food insecurity, they struggle with physical hunger on a regular basis. According to the Vermont Food Bank, which feeds over 150,000 Vermonters each year through a network of 225 food shelves and meal sites, 70% of their clients report purchasing inexpensive, unhealthy food because they can't afford healthier options. 56% have to choose between paying for food and paying for medicine or medical care. 52% have to choose between paying for food and housing. And over 50% of their clients' households use three or more coping strategies for food insecurity, such as pawning or selling personal property, watering down their food and drinks, and receiving help from friends and family. And I'm speaking now about Vermont, about the United States, one of the wealthiest and most food secure countries in the world, a world where one in nine people, almost 800 million, are chronically hungry, meaning that they've remained in a state for at least one year of inability to acquire enough food to meet basic dietary energy requirements, a world where two in seven people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, lacking vitamins and minerals essential for good health. At the end of my AmeriCorps stint, I transitioned to my current position, supervising Vermont Law School's Food and Agriculture Clinic and teaching global food security. Through both of these vehicles, students and I are working to understand the complexity of the current food system to envision the ideal food system, one oriented around human rights and environmental sustainability, 
and to address the question of how we as advocates can collaborate with others to get from here to there. And that's what brings me here. That is the question of this conference. The essence of the right to food is that all people deserve access at all times to sufficient, nutritious food. How do we get from here to there? Notably, the right to food is about more than just having access to food. The right to food contemplates that the food system itself must be oriented around human rights and environmental sustainability. In this way, the right to food recognizes, as I've had the chance to observe in my brief career, and as I'm sure we've all witnessed in our own ways, that the food we eat intersects with political and corporate systems and actors, with laws and policies, with farming methods, natural resources, the environment, our climate, and with human rights, culture, communities, and behavior. Accordingly, this conference will examine, locally and globally, how we balance advancing the right to food through complex geopolitical, biophysical, and human behavioral and cultural contexts and constraints. To be clear, the right to food does exist in law. It's an international human right. It appears in constitutions around the world, legislation, court opinions, and food and nutrition assistance programs. This conference will explore the current status of that right, as well as a related food sovereignty movement. However, recognizing the complexity of food security in the food system, as well as the limitations of law and policy, the broader purpose of the conference is to explore how, in and out of legal spheres, we can better fulfill the spirit of the right to food. We're looking across sectors and across professions, and we're suggesting by humble example that such inclusive and interdisciplinary collaboration is required to move the food system forward. As a deeply creative, entrepreneurial food movement now grows in Vermont, positioning itself to be a national model, and as Boko Haram now terrorizes food markets and farmers in Northeast Nigeria, driving that region to risk of famine, and sending the Nigerian police and army into an offensive frenzy so violent that Nigerians, I hear, are joining this extremist group for their own protection, it is time to bring the link between food systems and human rights into focus. Thank you. <laughs>